Hey guys, welcome back to part two about how to get your jet ski or your small boat to the Bahamas. Well, if you guys have returned for the second part of this video, you should have probably already watched part one. Um, I'll put a link in the description below to get to the first video. Maybe I'll be able to get it to pop up somewhere here on the screen as well. We'll see if I can get that one figured out also. The, um, if you're back for this part, you, if you've watched that first video, you should have probably already got some of this stuff done. So where I would be at probably right now, if you were outside of that 6 to 12 month window and range, um, you should have already decided where you're going. You should have already picked your crew who's going to be going with you. And hopefully you picked both of those based on experience and what you guys plan to do. So if this is your first trip, I sure hope that you guys have planned to go to West End or you plan to go to Bimney. Um, and kind of left it there. I really, once again, don't recommend you trying to plan a further trip on a first experience. If you've been before and you guys are going further, great. Hopefully you planned your crew accordingly for that too. Once again, don't try and take a crew of 20 boats to Staniel's K because you're not going to have a whole lot of luck trying to find lodging um, and docking and everything like that. So, you know, pick, pick your group accordingly on those things. But once again, at this point, you should have already done those things um, if we're here towards getting you guys onto that trying to trip. So... The next thing I would do once we've selected where we're going to go and we've selected our crew is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start looking for lodging where we plan to go. Now, I would tell you to start looking for lodging in the Bahamas first. And the reason is, is right now we're still at a point where we can kind of dictate what day we're going. So I can look and see what lodging is available for what days and maybe still adjust my time window schedule a little bit based on finding the lodging that's convenient for us. Um, lodging that I consider convenient for us, once again, is going to be somewhere where there's fuel on the island or very close by. I love the thought of having docking at my house. That's like a, we've done it before where we did not have docking at the house we were staying at. It does make it a whole lot more difficult. It adds a different dynamic to the trip, especially if you got a bunch of people staying with you and you're having to shuttle people from the house down to the marina every single time. And it adds a whole lot more time to your morning every morning um, and just a whole other factor that you got to watch out for. The, um, so start looking for lodging based on kind of, you know, where you think you can find some of these things like that that you're looking for. So we got a couple different resources that we'll use for some of this stuff. So I'll kind of go into where we start um, and where we're going to look for lodging and those kind of things. So typically, an out island's trip to the Bahamas is a little different than like trying to stay in Florida or something like that. So the lodging availability, I can't just go to a website and book a Marriott down in Samuels Key because they just don't exist. Um, and there's not really any resorts or anything like that in Samuels Key as well. So you're going to be booking private lodging. So typically the place we'll start is VRBO, Airbnb, those kind of things like that because you're going to get the best availability of trying to find something that's convenient and works good for you guys. So if you're depending on what, where you're going, once again, I always kind of look to see what's going to be available. So we'll go to like Airbnb or VRBO. Um, and, you know, we'll just look at Staniel's K, for example. So I pulled up Staniel's K, like if we were going to go here in the beginning of June. Um, we've got eight people with us, so once again, I'm going to look for lodging for eight people. Don't be afraid to split it up. So, in other words, if you can't find what you're looking for, you're going to have to be flexible on some of these trips. Book two two-bedrooms instead of one four-bedroom house. So just a great example here is in Staniel's K, for eight people, there's only seven units available that will sleep eight people. Um, so the first one right here, beautiful paradise home with a 70-foot dock, which just sounds great. Um... Rum Punch right here, which is an interior, it appears, home. Um, another one here, and this one's on the water, but does not appear to have any docking. Uh, same deal, this is like, looks like it's a beachfront home, so it's not going to have any docking. Um, and then Thunderball, obviously this appears to have a dock here, but it's also a little bit outside my price budget when I start looking at something like that on what we're going to want to pay for a nightly basis. So based on just like a quick preliminary look here, this right here seems to be my kind of like the home that I probably would start trending towards. Um, if this home right here has docking, which it does, obviously we can see there, um, it's not unreasonable if it's been split four ways um, on a nightly basis. So you can kind of just go ahead and do that and decide if that's what you want on that kind of trip. On you know, Plan this on something that you think you can afford. Once again, don't stress yourself on the finances of a trip like this, like I mentioned in the first video. Um, you're going to enjoy it a whole lot more if you're not worried about that kind of stuff. So as you kind of go through, you can kind of just start finding the homes that you think will work for you. Once again, a home that might work for me may not work for you guys. 
you're going to have to decide that on your own. But those are the two main tools that I'll start using when I'm looking for a house. It's going to be Airbnb, VRBO, um, because there's just not a whole lot in these out islands where you're going to get the opportunity to stay at a resort like a Bimini Sands even or something like that. Once I get past Bimini and Nassau, it's it's kind of a little different and everything like that. Um, the uh, West End obviously has stuff. Um, Abaco is huge, but Abaco does have a lot of, once again, like resort kind of things, but like Treasure K and places like that. But what I found with Treasure K was I had better luck still booking through Airbnb than I did uh, trying to book through Treasure K itself. So, once again, but those are all tools that you guys can use to try to find a place that you're going to look at. So, we'll go into these tools, and we'll start looking for the place that we're going to book. We'll go ahead and pick what we think is the best for our group, and we'll go ahead and book it. Um, what this does now is it gives me my time frame. So, I can go ahead and select my dates based on this. So, right here, like I had uh, June 1st to June 8th. So, we're just going to say that's my time window now is that's the dates we're going. We confirm with everybody. We booked the lodging. We're good to go on that. So, once we booked that part, We'll start looking at the second step on this, and it might seem like I went backwards, but then we'll start looking at where we're going to launch from in Florida, and we'll start looking at where we're going to stay in Florida as well. Um, once again, always book yourself two days out in advance. So we typically do a Saturday departure with a Saturday return. Um, so I will start looking at arriving in Florida Thursday afternoon. Um, so Thursday afternoon, I will already plan to be in Florida. It gives me a little bit of flexibility that if I needed to be in Florida before then, I probably could get there. But um, So I'll plan to be in Florida at my final destination Thursday afternoon. Um, and I do it a little bit different. So I see a lot of people do these trips, and they actually go ahead and launch and leave. So they'll arrive if they're launching on Saturday. They'll arrive Friday night, launch Saturday morning, and go. Um, once again, I still think you need to rest from the trip and everything like that. So typically what we do is... We start trying to find where, where it's going to be convenient for us to do these things. So, for example, I'm just going to use my trip as we go through this, more or less. Um, it'll kind of give you a little bit of rundown because you can use all the stuff for Bimini as well. So, we've done these a couple times. you got two locations for going to Daniels Key that are going to be your prime launch points. One's going to be Miami and Fort Lauderdale. We typically always choose Fort Lauderdale just because we know there's some secure parking and some convenience factors that we really enjoy. It doesn't mean that it's right for you. Once again, you can only make your decision based on what's right for your group. Um, I know a lot of people that have left out of Miami. Um, they left out of uh, Cranon Park, had some good luck over there. There's 24-hour parking at Cranon Park there in Miami. Um, I believe it's on Key Biscayne. Um, the uh, Hallover, Hallover, I believe, has got 24-hour parking and security as well. And, um, you know, they'll have a fee per night for you guys to be able to park your vehicle and uh, trailer there um, but those are two spots I know out of Miami that you can launch out of there are plenty of resort hotels with marinas and stuff in Miami as well so the same thing that I'm going to walk you through with Fort Lauderdale is completely available in Miami you just would have to do your research to figure out how you want to do it while you're down there so basically for Fort Lauderdale because we've done this one a couple times I kind of already know where we're going to go with it so we typically launch out of Harbor Town Marina so Harbor Town Marina um, is a marina in Fort Lauderdale that um has security, does allow overnight parking. I believe it, last year it was fifteen dollars a night, um, which is nothing for you know, your vehicle. It's kind of a secure location. You can see on the left hand side of the picture here, this is their launch area over here. This parking area here is all their parking for boats and trailers, um, and this is just on the Diana Canal right there, um, which actually just just like real close to the waterway, so you can get up to, to the waterway. Now we'll launch there. And we will launch Friday. So typically, once again, I'm going to get into Florida Thursday night, Thursday afternoon. I'll stay at a hotel, keep the boat in the trailer. It would be my initial plan for Thursday. Friday, we'll plan to launch the boat from Harbor Town, and I will stay at a place called Bahia Mar Friday night. Bahia Mar is a property in Fort Lauderdale that just has a marina attached to it. So I can stay at the hotel. My marina's right there. What this gives me the option to do is in the morning when I wake up, I can literally walk down to my boat, get on, and go. So at 5.30 in the morning, I'll get on the boat, and we'll start moving, and we'll go sit in the inlet of uh, Port Everglades right until that first sunlight cracks. And as soon as that first sunlight cracks, we'll go right out the inlet. Um, this gives us the option where the boat's fully loaded the night before. We're not stressing about anything in the morning. So, you know, where the launch point can be stressful. People are trying to scramble and get last-second things packed into everything. We don't do anything. We literally have a book bag that's in the hotel room that was our stuff for that night. And we throw it over our shoulder and we walk down and get on the jet ski and stuff the book bag in the jet ski. Or we stuff the book bag in a, somewhere on the boat and we literally fire it up and go. There's fuel there, so we're free, we're completely full on gas from the night before. So it's really convenient to do it this way. 
if you guys can do it this way, I highly recommend. I'm not saying you have to do it exactly like at Bahia Mar and launching from Harbor Town, but if you can do it where you launch the day before, your vessel's in the water, you've basically already done a pre-check then because you know that your vessel, everything's working, you're not running into any issues of something came loose when you drove down from Pennsylvania and all of a sudden you fire your jet ski or your boat up and there's a hose that's loose or something's not working right. All that's already been worked out because you launched the day beforehand. And that also gives you time to kind of resolve any of those kind of issues that you guys would have as well. Now, if you do decide to go any other ways, um, there are plenty of options for you guys to find things to do. So, um, once again, I know there's other resorts and marinas even in Fort Lauderdale. So, once again, this is not the end-all, be-all. I'm just kind of showing you guys how we do it. Um, if you're looking for boat ramps a little bit different as well, there are public boat ramps. Um, you can go to the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation uh, Commission website. And I should pull up all the public boat ramps. Um, I believe you can even pull it up by county. Let's see if I can go back here again. So that was Boward County, but like if I wanted Miami-Dade even. I go Miami-Dade. And I literally just pull up all the boat ramps that are in Miami-Dade County as well. These are the public boat ramps. So this won't pull up like a harbor town, which is a private marina and boat ramp. But these are the public ones that are public use. But you can click on them. And so for example, this is Crandon Park. I'm going to click on more info. And it will give me kind of the rundown so it's got parking for 135 over there um, one single lane seven double lanes so it's a total of 15 lanes which is massive actually um, and it's got their parking fees the annual fees everything like that so you can kind of get a rundown on how much it'll cost for you to use that ramp and for you to park over there um, so you know this is a great starting point one of the big things I always tell people to look at for this is make sure that the ramp that you pick is a 24-hour ramp we have had issues before where we've showed up at a ramp that we thought was a 24-hour ramp, got there and it was not, and had to make some last-second adjustments. So once again, that's another big one. Just make sure when you're picking these ramps that I, believe, I know this one is, but if you're picking a ramp that's a 24-hour ramp, that would allow 24-hour parking. So at that point, you've kind of selected your hotel, um, where you're going to stay, if you're going to launch and go, or if you're going to try and get a marina, like I, like I really highly recommend you guys do. Um, so the next part of that from there, we're booked in the Bahamas. Basically, I mean, we've got the essentials on our trip done. Um, we know the dates we're going. We've got our crew picked, and we're booked for our lodging for prior to the Bahamas and the Bahamas stay. Um, one of the big things I will tell you guys is I get people ask all the time, you know, about camping and things like that. You do not want to camp in the Bahamas. The bugs are horrendous. After a day of being beat up out the sun and the heat, the last thing you want to do is spend an entire night fighting bugs and whatever else that you're going to fight while you're out there. I've seen people try it. Most of them, they wind up just miserable um, and booking some kind of lodging the next day. So uh, definitely won't recommend that, guys. Go ahead and spend the money and go ahead and get your, uh, your lodging set up the way that it needs to be set up. So once we've got that part of the trip really planned right there, we'll start looking at what's next so what happens after we launch and leave Fort Lauderdale to go to the Zumas this year um, we're going to start picking our first stops where we're going to refuel uh, planning our route um, and the most important one I shouldn't say the most important one but one of the big ones is the first thing we're going to do is our first port we land and we have to clear customs and immigration so what all is needed to clear customs and immigrations into the Bahamas? So there are several resources you guys can use to kind of find these. Um, one that I go to all, all the time is the uh, Bahamas.com, which is the Bahamas' actual official website um, to figuring out what to do with this kind of stuff. So they've got their set of rules sitting on the website here on how to enter the Bahamas by boat. So basically, you're going to need a copy of your Bahamas Customs and Clearance form. If I click this little PDF button right here, it's actually going to pull that form up. So I can go ahead and print that form off in advance. Go ahead and do this, print it off in advance. You guys go ahead and fill it out the night before you leave. Um, that's what we typically do on this is we'll fill that one out the night before we leave as well. The um, one Bahamas immigration card per person. This one's a little weird because it says you need the Bahamas immigration card to get in. You're going to get that while you're there. So you're going to clear customs first and then you're going to go to immigration. Um, I'm going to go into a little more to that. The um, passport, everybody on your vessel is going to need an active passport um, from the United States. If they're all U.S. citizens, they'll need a passport that's valid. Um, and then you're going to need the vessel registration and documentation. This is a good time to start making sure you've got all that stuff. Um, and then, once again, a few days before you leave, double check and make sure you have all this stuff. A uh, prime example is uh, a couple years back, we were doing a Bahamas trip. I did a boat run with some friends and hit a hard wake. My glove box flew open. Something flew out. Didn't think anything of it at the time because we didn't know what it was. Four days before I was leaving to go on this Bahamas trip, um, 
I want to go check for my registration, and my registration was gone. My registration is what had flown out of the glove box. If I would not have looked four days in advance, and I would have just went down to Florida, I would have been done because I wouldn't have had my registration to get into the Bahamas. So always just make sure before you leave, a few days before you leave, that you've got everything there. Um, that gives you a couple days to kind of get it back together if you need to. Once again, because I was figured out while I was still local to my home state, I was able to go get this registration and get it done. So if you're arriving by boat, all Boston, as I'll mention here, all visiting boaters must clear customs and immigration at the nearest port of entry. Um, as you're entering the port of entry, you're going to fly a yellow quarantine flag. Um, this just lets them know that you guys have not cleared uh, customs or anything yet. Um, this is good because if you're pulling into a marina, um, it's going to let them know that you're doing that, and typically they won't harass you about trying to charge you to stay there. So customs and immigration, if you're going to West End, is great. Customs and immigration at West End is literally right there at the fuel dock. You pull up to the fuel dock area. There's a little building right there. You're going to walk in, and it's very super inconvenient. I mean, it's super convenient for you to be able to do this um, because you can have somebody fuel on the boat up, basically, while you're claiming your customs and immigration because the only person who can leave the vessel, whether it's a boat or a jet ski, is the captain of the vessel. So if you've got four or five people on a boat, the captain's going to be responsible for getting everybody checked in. They're going to take the passports, um, all the uh, customs paperwork and stuff like that. They're going to have to fill out all the immigration cards. Um, for everybody and kind of get everybody checked in. Now, there is a little insider's tip here. So, the immigration forms that you need to fill out for everybody that's on the trip with you has to be an actual form. In other words, you can't... It's not like what I just showed you with the customs form where I can print that off and fill it out. It actually has to be the Bahamas form itself. So, there's nowhere I can go print that out. I have to have the original form. There is a Bahamas tourism office in Florida, the Ministry of Tourism, um, that's listed right here, and that's their phone number. If you call and are super nice to these guys, they will typically mail you those forms in advance, and I highly recommend this. They've given them to us every year so far. The reason I recommend this is because as a captain, if you have five people on your boat with you, you're going to be stuck sitting there filling out five customs forms. As to where if I can get these in advance, we can fill them all out the night before, and I literally walk into the, uh, the immigrant, excuse me, immigration forms. I can walk into the immigration office, and everything's filled out. I hand it out. Boom, get the stamps and these passports. I'm back on my boat, and we're on our way. So this is kind of a little insider tip. Not everybody probably does this, but I do highly recommend you doing that. Once again, if you're real nice about it, typically we've had success every year so far in getting them to actually send us those forms. So once again, back to entering and exiting. So if... You know, we've got those forms already. Basically, um, everybody on forward must have uh, all that stuff filled out. You're going to have to have your passport. The captain himself will have to go ahead and, and take this stuff over to the Customs and Immigration. Here it typically says the um, Customs and Immigration officials will come to your vessel. I have never had that happen, not once. I'm sure there will be some other people that will tell me they've had it happen every time, but so far we've never had that happen, period. So, um be prepared to go ahead and walk and do this. So, once again, West End super easy. Bimney, you're going to go to Big Game Club. Um, Customs is at Big Game Club. Um, so dock there. They'll let you dock for free. And immigration, you'll walk just down the road. You'll make a right when you come out of Customs. And you'll see a police station down there. And immigration is there. So once again, just give you guys a little heads up where that is over there in Bimney as well. The um, If you have a firearm on board, <laughs> so this one's always a little interesting. So I always see people talking and asking about bringing a firearm with them um, on these trips. I never personally once have felt threatened enough to think that I needed a firearm on this trip. Um, don't get me wrong, I do carry knives on the boat. I do have a flare gun, things like that. But um, those are more for emergency situations on the boat than obviously you know any kind of protection. Um, we did have one person carry a gun on one of our trips, and I'll just give you our brief story. Um, so if you have a firearm, basically you have to claim it through the Bahamas Customs and Immigration and all that when you guys are going through there. The, um, they're going to track that you have it. It has to stay on the boat. It has to stay locked. It can't be pulled out for any reason whatsoever. Uh, I believe they even take account of the ammo you got and everything like that. Something that I did not know, and we found out after the fact on this one too, is um, Bimney. If you were checking in into Bimney, Bimney will not let you clear a firearm. So I don't know if West End will, um, but if you're trying to go somewhere like further than Bimney, like to Staniel's K, um, Nassau or any of those places, I would probably, if you're carrying a firearm, try checking in with Cat Key, which is a few miles south of Bimney, um, before I check in in Bimney. Because I can tell you right now, when we were in Bimney, they would not let us continue with the firearm. They said it was a Bimney, it was a Bimney rule, not a Nassau rule, or excuse me, a Bahamas rule, but that Bimney did not let people continue on with weapons. So they confiscated the weapon there, and we actually had to make arrangements when we were passing back through 
to be able to pick that back up. So it actually added additional time on our trip on the return because we had to make sure we planned it right where we could get somebody at the police station in the morning to be able to get our friend's uh, firearm back. I typically just would tell you don't bring one. I mean, if you don't, if you don't have to, don't. But um, if you do feel the need, I just wanted to let you know that you know I probably wouldn't try clearing through Bimini on it because there's a strong possibility they're just going to tell you no go on doing that. So as you're going through all this, there is um there are some entry fees to enter the Bahamas. So if you got a boat less than 35 feet, it's 150 bucks. A boat over 35 feet, it's 300 dollars. Um, typically in the past, this has been a cash deal where you've had to pay cash. I know for a fact West End has now started taking credit cards, and I am pretty sure Bimini has now started taking credit cards as well. Bimini, don't quote me on because I can't remember that one for a fact, but I know for sure West End has started accepting credit cards. I would still just tell you to bring cash in all these because it's quick and easy. Once again, if you get there and their internet's down and things aren't working right and you're trying to clear with the credit card, you could be delayed hours while they're trying to get internet back up. I would just show up with cash, pay the cash, and just move on. Um, what you're going to get for that, you're going to get your cruising permit. You're going to get a fishing permit for the vessel um, so you guys can do some fishing while you're down there. And it also covers a departure tax which is good for up to three additional people beyond the captain, I believe. Um, each additional person after that is charged an additional $20, so if you're checking five people in your boat, you're going to have to pay an additional $20 per person above that three. Um, and I believe the fee is good for a second re-entry up to 90 days. Um, I won't cover really staying more than 12 months or any of that stuff because really most people who are looking at these videos are probably doing the same thing I'm doing, and we're going for a week. 10 days tops um, so basically at that point that's kind of what you will need to clear customs um, I'm sure I might have missed some stuff in there if I did please comment below and I'll make sure to bring it up in the next video the um, the return to the US with customs your um, things have changed in the last year on that for people who haven't been recently um, I'm a member of the small vessel reporting system. Typically what I've done in the past is I was able to just call a 1-800 number, give them my small vessel reporting system number, and they would just clear me, and I would move on. Um, they have now changed that. So SVRS, the small vessel reporting system, is now dead. So if you haven't cleared in a while, that system no longer is working. They have replaced it with a program called CBP Roam. So CBP Roam is an app that goes on your smartphone. You go ahead and register everybody prior to the trip. Um, so you have all the information on there, and when you come back into the United States, you actually go into this app and let the, uh, the, the U.S. Customs people know that you've arrived. Basically, what they will do is, a little bit after that, you will receive a phone call on your cell phone, um, and they will say, are you available for a video chat? And they will video chat with you and talk to all the people on the trip. So what it does now is it gives them the option to be able to video chat with you and actually clear you through customs through a video chat versus... Um, having to go actually into customs or the old way of where we had to um, call the 1-800 number before. I had to do this last year. Actually pretty convenient. If you still have an SVRS number as well, you can put that in and supposedly it's supposed to help on that clearing process. But I found it was pretty easy. It was a phone call. The one thing I would do tell you, don't let anybody leave because if they're registered on your trip and they call, they're going to want to speak to everybody via that video chat. So we were passing my phone around to everybody who was on the boat on that trip. Um, the next thing we'll start doing, because this is basically all of our custom stuff, and um, the next thing we'll start doing is we'll just go ahead and we'll start planning our actual trip. So we know where we're leaving from now, we know what we're staying, where we're going, we know the days that we're going, all that kind of stuff. So what we're going to start planning for now is um, the chart, the path we're going to take to get there, where we're going to stop, and fuel stops. So. We'll start planning this part um, based on the equipment that's going with us. So we know the equipment that's going with us this year. We probably got in the fuel tanks in moderate conditions about a 100-mile range. So we know that we, we can safely even say that even in moderate conditions that we should be able to make this 100 miles. We will carry additional fuel with us, which will extend that range, but we're going to play that additional fuel is like emergency backup stuff. We don't, we don't want to play beyond that. So basically what we're going to start looking at is we're going to start looking at planning our trip. Um, I'll use the Navionics app, as I've mentioned to you guys before. Um, works great. It's easy for me to work with and plan, um, and it really is pretty convenient. Um, I did see somebody comment on one of the last videos that there is a, a computer version, which is pretty nice. i have not messed with that at all, but that would be something I would possibly look into for planning as well if somebody was more uh, comfortable in something like that. So, once again, I'm going to use my trip as an example. So, we're going out of uh, Fort Lauderdale. So, I will start in Port Everglades to start routing my trip. 
I know that our first closest point of uh, departure for us is going to be Bimini. That's where we're going to clear customs and we're going to do our first refueling stop. So I'll go ahead and use this and use their auto charting feature to go ahead and plan my way to Bimini. You see all these little pink lines and these pink lines on here are actually the preferred shipping lanes. Um, I do highly recommend following those lines because if there's going to be other boats following those lines. So if you run into a situation or an emergency situation and you're staying with those lines, you're really going to have a high likelihood of running across somebody else as well. So we know that we're going into Bimini and we are going to be checking into customs. So right there, it's 57 miles for us. And I can kind of zoom back out and see my little chart and map here. So we know it's 57 miles, we know that's within our fuel range, so we're good on that. So the next thing we'll start doing is we're going to start looking for where we're going to refuel from here. So here on the map, on the top left, you're going to see a little like magnifying glass. If I click the magnifying glass, right here, I can hit fuel stations. And it's going to pull up my nearest fuel station. So the nearest one is Bimini Sands Marina, so the, the location that I have right there. Now, I do know there's other fuel there, even though it's not pulling it up. So once again, you got to do a little more research than what even this app will just tell you. But Bimini Sands, so we know that there's one fuel stop. Once again, we like backup plans. So we'll go back in here. And I will zoom back out. So this is uh, Big Game Club here. I know there's no fuel at Big Game Club, but I just happen to know from being here several times, there is a small craft facility right there where it says fuel, and this is at Blue Water Marina. So Blue Water Marina actually has a larger one on this main dock here as well, but also there's a little small craft uh, fuel pump over there also. So there's two fuel or fuel pumps there. So right now, we've got two backup plans in Bimini on fuel. So we will probably be Big Game Club where we departed up here. And we will go to Blue Water first and try and fuel in Blue Water. If Blue Water for some reason doesn't have fuel, then we will exit out and we will go over to Bimini Sands and we will try and get fuel from Bimini Sands. Um, so from here, we're going to fill up and we know that we've got another 100 miles to clear. Um, that's our max distance. So once again, I already kind of know this one, but the um, our next stop is going to be the Barrier Islands. It's going to be Chub K is where we're planning or intending to go right now to stop. So... I will pull us pulling out of Bimini Sands, or not Bimini Sands, but just Bimini in general. Once again, you'll see the pink lines here. This is to the center of the ocean, and here is Chug K. So it's going to go ahead and start auto charting this route for me as well. Pull this back up just so we can see the distance. So it's 94 miles. So we know that's within our 100 mile range that we're talking about. Um, Yeah, I'll zoom back out and just kind of look at the chart, make sure nothing looks a little crazy, but you know, it's just following, once again, the safest path it can follow to do this. Um, for most of you that don't know, you're going to spend a good portion of this trip on the Bahamas Bank in about 10 foot of water, which is kind of crazy. But um, anyway, so we'll get over to Chub K, and this will be our next refueling stop. We know that's 94 miles. Um, the next stop from here typically would be Nassau. We will actually probably do the calculations, carry enough fuel that we can leave Bimini and probably make it to Nassau. Um, just in case Chub K doesn't have fuel. But once again, for redundancies, we're going to look. So we're going to pull this up at Chub K right here. We're going to hit the little search glass again, fuel stations. So Chub K is the next, obviously the closest to where we're at right there. The next one's going to be Morgan's Bluff. So Morgan's Bluff, I can click on Morgan's Bluff and it actually takes me there. But do a little automatic routing. Let's just see where it is from Chub K. across the water. So it's about 18 miles from Chubb's K, Chubb K to Morgan's Bluff. So we know now that we do have a backup plan again that if we don't have enough fuel to make it to Nassau that we can go ahead and we can go over to Morgan's Bluff and catch fuel there. So once again, just redundancy plans. We'll, you know, Chubb K is our fuel plan. The backup plan will now be our own personal fuel we're going to carry and then we've got a third plan there as well. So leaving Chub K, we'll go ahead and just plan the trip from Chub K. We would plan it into Nassau. Once again, just making sure we got enough fuel. Running into Nassau. 
Nassau is only 42 miles, so we know we got more than enough fuel to pull that one off. Um, we will probably overnight in Nassau. Um, there's multiple marinas and places that you guys can stay there. Um, one of the ones we like is a place called Palm Key. Um, Palm Key is on the most southern point of Nassau, and that's why we like it, because there's, once again, a protected marina right here, and they got fuel there. But the beautiful part is we're leaving from the most southern point of Nassau, and we're still heading south down to the Exumas. And so it puts us closest to our destination. So if we're the closest to our destination, the less fuel we absolutely have to have with us as well. Um, so I highly recommend that when you're planning fuel stops is try and plan where you can get as close, yourself as close to your destination as you can. Um, we'll probably overnight in Palm Key and then leave from there going to Staniels, the route for us down there. So we know it's now 79 miles to get from Palm Key to Staniels. So we know we can make that as well. So we will go ahead and probably make that our plan on going ahead and going down to Staniels. Um, well, I should probably make some stops going up from the north end. Um, one of the big parts with Exuma, though, is just there's such limited fuel that this is where the whole lodging and everything comes into play. So, like, if I just pull here where we're at, I, I do my fuel search that we've done. There's only two places in, in Exuma. There's Highborn K and Stainer K. Other than that, you got to get all the way down to Great Exuma, which is, like, 40 or 50 miles away. So, once again, plan the trip well. So, stay at Staniel, stay at Highborn, somewhere where there's fuel right there, and you've got easy access to this stuff. Um... So once again, at this point, we basically, we've decided where we're going, who's going with us, where we're staying. We've booked everything, where we're going, where we're staying. Um, we have charted our trip. I will actually take those charts that I just did right there. I will email them myself and upload them into my GPS on the boat or the jet ski, so I already have them. Um, so everything's already planned through that point. We've got our, our routes charted. We've got backup plans on fuel um, and everything like that. We've made sure that we've got all of our customs paperwork in order, um, things that we're going to need for customs. Um and our kind of our fueling stops and everything like that. We picked a launch point. I mean, there's a lot that's going on in this video right here to kind of get you well on your way to your trip. Really, in theory, your trip is booked and kind of set right now. Um, the next video that I'll do will probably go more in depth into how we pick the things that we're going to do while we're on these trips, the locations that we'll like snorkel or we'll fish, uh, grab food, um, you know, some planning like that. Um, I'll probably also go over a packing list of things that I'll start working on to get together for myself. And those two lists are a little bit different for a boat and a jet ski, but I'll kind of look at both of them as we go. Um, also, uh, probably another week or two after that, I will go into more into the equipment. Um, I'm kind of waiting to try and be able to get the boat and jet skis out of storage and stuff like that so I can actually show you guys what's all my stuff and what we use and what we take with us. So if you guys have any questions, let me know. Um, once again, some of the stuff that we'll still be hitting on a little bit later. I um, appreciate you guys watching. Um, make sure to smash the subscribe button, and you guys have a great night. Thanks.